Welcome, everyone. Humans are complex beings. Therefore, pain is quite complicated. We still don't know everything about the brain, but we are way ahead of where we were 10 to 12 years ago about understanding where pain comes from and how our pain processes work. In today's episode, we're going to get nerdy and talk about one of the important theories in pain processing that is proving to be ahead of its time. It's called the narrow matrix of pain. Since our current medical model does not have the luxury of time to really explain what all that stuff means, it often lands on the role of the coach and chronic pain educator to explain really what this is all about. So welcome to the Chronic Pain Experience podcast. I am your host, Dina Chopolis, and I am the head pain coach and chief curator at Pain to Possibilities. In this episode, I will be speaking with a very knowledgeable Pan Zhang about pain science and the neural matrix of pain. Welcome, Pan. Thank you again for wanting to do this conversation in the first place. I know we can get a little excited about things that we really are passionate about, but not many people get passionate about this sort of thing. So uh, thank you so much for coming on board. No problem. It is. I love talking about this. So any chance I get, I am on it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I fully appreciate that. Uh, so let me tell our listeners a little bit about, about you. Pan is a physical therapist turned chronic pain coach. She specializes in helping people with chronic pain who have been through the medical mill and have turned out on the other side, no better or no worse. After being a physical therapist for 12 years, Pan found that her clients with chronic pain needed more. They need a guided, holistic approach that she just couldn't provide in the clinic's confines. As a chronic pain coach, Pan tackles real, meaningful goals, helps to figure out your triggers, teach you how to deal with flare-ups, and help you make real progress to get back to your lives. Before we begin, I always like to start off our conversation with a few key points for our listeners. I know, Pan, you know all this stuff, but I think it's a message that needs to be repeated quite a bit with our listeners because they don't often get to hear this message. We know that pain is bio, psycho, social in nature. Yep. Which means that there is always a biological aspect, a psychological component, and the social piece is really important too. And we cannot address pain without addressing all of them. Our conversation will definitely include all of those aspects. Currently, our medical model really just focuses on the biological Pan, as a physiotherapist, you guys were super good at the biological, but I also know a whole lot of physiotherapists like yourself who are really good at um, stretching that and getting into the psychological and getting into the social piece too. It is really important to know when it comes to chronic pain that everything matters. And that's for our listeners to just keep in their brain. Everything matters when it comes to pain. It's also important to know that pain is always 100% of the time both emotional and physical. And so we're going to address both. So Pan, how would you describe to our listeners what the neural matrix theory is? So basically in a nutshell, the neural matrix theory is basically the biopsychosocial aspect of mm-hmm. pain. It's just mm-hmm. that in a nutshell, except it's applied to your brain. Right. So if you look at functional fMRIs of people in pain and people not in pain, there's not one pain center in your brain. The, in fact, pain is a confluence of a bunch of different processing centers in your brain. And that's essentially what the neural matrix is, is what parts of your brain are being used to deliver your pain experience is what I like to call it. And right. pain experience sounds like fun, but it's not, I, I know it's not. Really fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. That's essentially the pain neural matrix in a nutshell. Uh, so when we talk about the brain and the pain processes and different parts of the brain that are involved, we know, obviously, if we were to talk about just the emotions itself, talk a little bit about how mm-hmm. emotions affect the brain and brain pathways when it comes to chronic pain. Yeah, emotions, especially stress, fear is a huge one. Stress and fear are very, very closely connected, right? Those are going to both fire up the amygdala Mm -hmm. and those are going to secrete a lot of hormones from your gut as well as your brain. Mm -hmm. And those all cascade into different areas of your body. So when you are feeling tense and tight, like kind of, you know, you know how it is in through the shoulders and in through the neck, take a deep breath relax. And that can actually tone down that amygdala firing and tone down some of that stress and fear response. So 
that's a big part of it. I think the stress and the fear is one of the, the two of the biggest factors in terms of the emotional response when it comes to pain. Right. So I think it's really important for listeners to understand too, as we're getting into this, that in no way, shape or form, are we at all suggesting that their pain is all in their head, right? We know that pain is produced by a a very complicated process in the brain. So it does start in the brain, but I think there is that fear that uncomfortable feeling for our chronic pain community that they're really, people are assuming it's all in your head when it's not right. We know that pain is real, but we also know that pain is both physical and emotional. So I just want to put that out there first that people aren't, when they're listening to this, aren't assuming, Oh, here they go again. (laughs) They're, they're telling me it's all in my head, which we're not. Yes. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And it's one of those, it's a bad stigma. Like Mm. what you were saying before, a pain is bio cycle and social. But Mm. when we start talking about that cycle social aspect, Mm. that's when people are like, Whoa, I don't want to be talking about this. This has nothing to do with my pain. Right. 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 Yeah. But unfortunately it does. It is. And, and, and mostly because we're all connected, right? We, we, we cannot separate mm-hmm. the two. You've touched on some really good points there. And I'm going to try to remember to get back to some of them, but what would fall into the biological piece? We know that, you know, most of our chronic pain community is a little more familiar with what the biological entails, right? But let's maybe let's have a little conversation around what the biological truly incorporates beyond just the procedures the pills, uh, and imaging. I mean, if you have an injury, let's say an Mm -hmm. acute injury, an acute injury is something that, um, for instance, like a, an ankle sprain that, that happens, it causes tissue damage when there's actual tissue damage, that is an actual biological process there. Right. But with chronic pain, what happens is pain lingers even after the tissue is healed and there's no more tissue damage. You know, your MRIs are coming back negative. Your lab results, blood tests are all coming back negative. Your CT scans are negative and you're super frustrated um, because everything is fine, but you're still in a lot of pain, right? So that's the biological aspect. Another bit of the biological aspect that kind of gets overlooked is the neuro component. Mm. So Pain is a two-way street between your body and your brain. So signals are sent up from your body, figured out, computed in your brain. And then it's your brain kind of tells your body, okay, this is what to do. This is what's going on. We need to pay attention to this. We don't need to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. So one of the biological aspects is the signals that are getting set up to your, sent up to your brain. There's a whole network of different nerves, different chemicals Mm -hmm. that can alter the sensitivity or the volume of the signal getting sent up into your brain. Now this is fun. We're getting into the nerdy stuff. As far as a complicated process and there's chemicals involved, you know, how does pain sort of imprint itself into the nervous system. I know over time, if it's been doing it long enough, but what happens is you have like little neurotransmitters. So like part of the chemical aspect that keeps bombarding a certain area of your nerves. Mm. And what happens is if you over bombard an area of your nerves, that nerve can get really sensitive. So your brain is that area is like, okay, I'm getting this in the past. This has been a bad thing. So Mm. also like your body learns, that's what it does. It's conditioned to learn. Mm. So if it keeps getting bombarded and your brain keeps saying, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. The next time you get a little bit of something in there, then your brain automatically goes to this is bad. So that's when you have hypersensitivity. So for those people out there that have pain, when you just have like a little touch, yeah, you're like, I should be having pain that, that I know that that's not supposed to be painful, Mm -hmm. but it's painful to me. My skin feels like it's like painful. That's that hypersensitivity component. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to tone that down. There are biological and psychological Mm -hmm. ways to tone that down. Right. I once um, interviewed a gentleman who recovered from chronic pain and is as a result, he's a chronic pain coach now too, but uh, he had a great analogy and I love to share this one. It was um, if you were to be outside in your backyard and you had a light or motion detector and every time a 
wind came through, uh, a blade of grass would blow in the wind. And then if you multiply by that by all the blades of grass in your backyard, that's sort of that oversensitivity, that um, sensitivity that happens as a result of multiple messages and time um, with multiple messages coming through. So I thought, well, that's a great way to be able to remind people about a sensitivity issue if they don't quite understand what it means to have sensitivity. Because they'll hear that word, but they may not necessarily know what it means. <laughs> How would you best describe to our listeners what that sensitivity really means? Basically means that your nervous system has learned over time exactly what are bad signals, what are bad things. Right Now, what happens is instead of you going through the processing of, okay, is that a bad thing or a good thing that's happening to me? Mm-hmm your nervous system has learned that that is a bad thing and it's going to hype up your alarm. Pain is just your alarm system, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to turn off or turn up that alarm very, very fast and very, very loud because it's learned over repetition over months, years, decades, that that is a bad thing. And that bad thing could be anything from cold temperature Mm -hmm. changes Mm -hmm. to just mechanical changes. So bending over. So you have mechanical receptors in your body that tells you um, that your body is like, okay, you're bending over, you're lift, raising your arm, you know, these types of things. Nice. So what happens is those receptors get really sensitive. Right. So I had a patient once that every time she bent over, mm-hmm. she was just basically on her back for like a week, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't, so if this is straight, she couldn't bend over for more than like maybe 10 or 15 degrees. Like it was not a functional way to live. And all we did was just teach her brain and her body. Like, you know, that's okay. It's not going to cause any damage. You just have to reverse engineer the whole process. Right. So well said. It's important for our chronic pain community to know that whatever got us there, we can essentially undo to a point, right? There is, um, well, you know, you know the word, but bioplasticity, uh, neuroplasticity are the hopeful words, right? The words that we can really use to offer the community, hey, if, if, if all these habits or all these signals have come in over the years, we can teach new signals to be able to unwind that. So there is hope, right? Yes, 100%. Okay, so the biological issue we touched on a little bit for sure, and there's probably a lot more we could talk about. But when we talk about the psychological, I know that's always a huge part of the conversation, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. How in the neuromatrix theory is the psychological portion important? So I think we talked about that a little bit with yeah. fear, yes. anxiety, yes. stress. Yes. Those are going to, so it's not just like, oh, I'm stressed out. I have more pain. What mm-hmm. happens is when you're stressed out, your body is actually releasing specific hormones mm-hmm. that causes different reactions based on your history. So it's not, this is again, not one of those, it's just in my head kind of things. Mm-hmm. It starts in your head, kind of like you were saying before, mm-hmm. but then it cascades through the rest of your body. Right. Right. And I think what's important to know too, is I, I, inside of these Facebook groups that are support, uh, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people inside these Facebook groups Mm -hmm. and that is the real sticking point. They are so stuck in the belief that it pain is purely a tissue damage. Right. And if they're pain, they must've done something wrong. And so, you know, if we can gently coax them into the belief that there's so much more to it, we talked about, you mentioned cortisol. Are there other, mm-hmm. other chemicals that are going to be sort of heightened at that point or? Yes, totally. So different fluctuations. So not necessarily heightened, but like things like dopamine and serotonin, your feel good chemicals can yeah. plummet, which yeah. can cause different things, right? Yeah. So you don't always want lots and lots of dopamine either. Mm-hmm. You don't want to, you don't always want all those feel good chemicals all the time, because then what happens is you need more and more of that. So that's where addiction happens. And that's just mm-hmm. a whole different topic, right? But that's an, a whole different aspect of it as well. And when I talk to a lot of my clients in terms of addiction, they're like, I'm not, I, you know, I don't have any substance abuse or anything like that. And then I ask them about their phone mm-hmm. and yes. I ask them about their social media use. And they're like, well, yeah, sure. But did you know that when you're on your phone and you're on social media, you're yeah. getting dopamine hits yeah. every time you scroll 
the problem with that is it's going to make you feel really, really good at the time. And it's going to make you feel like you're escaping your world, which you kind of are a little bit. Yeah. The problem is you need to be on your phone for longer mm-hmm. and longer and longer. And you you search out more and more specific um, content mm-hmm. that makes you be on your phone for longer. Yeah. And then you get into that nasty cycle. It's, so that kind of, we, we kind of took a little bit of a detour there, Yeah, but yeah. No, that's good because it gives a real life example of um, taking us beyond sort of what we know, you know, and, and you're right when it comes to addiction, it's really easy to believe that it's just substance, but even sugar. I mean, if we are seeking that dopamine in way other ways too, like phones or uh, sugar or YouTube or whatever that needs to be addressed as well. Cause that's going to affect the emotional side you did touch on before. And I know I meant to go back into this when we talked about the biological piece, can we talk a little bit about the gut and how it affects your emotions, especially? Yes, for sure. So the gut is actually called your second brain mm-hmm. because you produce actually more hormones. I believe dopamine and spe- specifically, or is it serotonin? One of those two that is actually produced more in your gut than in your brain. Right. The so, serotonin. serotonin. Absolutely. Yep. So when you, people are talking about, um, the, this kind of goes into the social aspect. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing a nutrition things and you're Mm -hmm. trying to, um, eat better or, you know, cut out gluten or whatever foods that you may be, may think that you're sensitive to, that is going to have a huge impact on your, uh, on your pain, because if your gut is happier, then it's going to actually balance out the hormones, which the hormones are what makes you feel good or feel bad, happy or sad. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Especially when we talk about, as you mentioned earlier, the whole pain experience, you know, Mm -hmm. it is such a part of the experience and the experience is big, right? Because there's many things we can do to help um, sort of make that experience a little less, hopefully, (laughs) you know, and that's Mm -hmm. just one of the strategies. So I don't say it to overwhelm people. I know our listeners might be feeling like, oh God, there's another thing I need to do, but I think awareness is key. And I think, like you said, really off the stuff, the bat, a coach is really helpful for breaking down that overwhelm and taking it step by step. Uh, so that you can get through all these different aspects. Okay, so we touched a little bit on the psychological piece. Now, when we talk about the pathways in the brain, and we talked a little bit about the emotional side, wanted to ask you a little bit about anxiety. Um, I know that taps back into the whole chemical release and whatnot, but you know, when you're working with your clients and they have that fear around movement or fear of pain coming back or not being able to go on vacation, you know, what sort of forms do you see fear come in, in your practice? Um, so a lot of it is fear of change, Mm. um, and fear of, so it's really interesting. Um, fear of change a bit is a big one. I'll kind of circle back to that, but yeah. just fear of your past experiences. So yeah. I've had patients or in clients who said, you know, I haven't done this specific activity for years because the last time I did it, it put me in bed. I couldn't get out of bed for like three weeks. Right. And I'm like, okay, so what we do is actually slowly take baby steps into that activity again. So right. again, I had another client who couldn't walk on sand. Mm-hmm. Um, she really enjoyed walking on the beach, but she had this chronic ankle issue. And she mm-hmm. said, every time she would walk on sand, it would really flare up. And I asked her when the last time she did that. And she was like, probably two years ago, mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So we actually started pacing her. I'm like, when you go to the beach, just, stand on the sand Mm -hmm. and it's part of part of it is to get your body and your brain on the same page and just standing do you think you can do that she's like I think I can do that and it's just slowly decreasing that threat volume and then okay well why don't we take five steps and then just come on back right and then 10 steps and then come on back and you really just slowly introduce that scary activity Mm -hmm. and honestly a lot of times when you haven't done an activity for a long time, it is literally just the thought mm-hmm. of the flare up yes. that really stops you, not the actual activity itself. Absolutely. Oh, great point to make. Yes. So true. And I find it interesting how, and I remind people that this just how the body and the brain are so connected is that 
the whole anxiety treatment or, or um, cognitive behavioral treatment for anxiety is very much the same thing. It's just that gradual exposure, right? So it really is not a lot of difference between the cognitive and the physical function functionality as far as how we get back on track. So you're right, little teeny baby steps. It's fantastic. Fear of change, yes, you said. Also fear is past experience. I think the, the fear of past experience really speaks to how context matters. Everything matters when it comes to chronic pain. And so, you know, give me some examples of perhaps what your clients would be fearing. Um, I think I know the answer, but would love to hear some relevant uh, examples of how their past experience really held them back. Yeah. So the flare up is the biggest thing. Um, And the next, I kind of wanted to talk about the fear of change. Yes, Yes. So your, your body and your brain want to stay the same. Mm -hmm. they want homeostasis, which is just a fancy word for just staying the same. They don't want change. Change is bad, especially if you've been in pain for a long time, Mm -hmm. any change is bad, even change for the better. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate. It's really hard for your brain and your body to understand this is going to get me better. Especially if you've had flare-ups trying things that would get you better before Mm -hmm. like exercise programs and things like that, that haven't been guided properly. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of my clients are very resistant and they're very anxious and fearful to try something new because it's their body's alarm system holding them back and saying, no, I can't do that. It's not going to be good for me. And, you know, here's the deal. Don't ever feel like you're not trying Mm -hmm. and don't ever feel like you're ashamed because you are fearful of trying something new. That is literally just your body's defense mechanism, right? You just have to understand like, this is going to make me better. This is going to put, push me forward Mm -hmm. to be able to change. For sure. It's putting a lot of faith into the process, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And especially when there's a physical sensation around that faith and that trust, Mm -hmm. that becomes more difficult for sure. But you're right. I think being guided properly, um, and it's almost that continual messaging of safety. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Like I can do this, or it seems reasonable or, you know, um, I like my feet in the sand, you know, those are important messages, right. To, to, to tell ourselves. So yeah, the fear of change, uh, the fear of past experience. Absolutely. I think that's probably the most difficult thing is change in itself, even without chronic pain. I know part of the reason our uh, medical model is the way it is, is because it's quick, right. And people want, (laughs) they don't necessarily want to do the work or know how to do the work. And so it's easier to fall into the, well, is there a medication for that? Not to knock the medications, but there is so much more to it that, you know, we know as well. Okay, Pan. So we've talked about the biological portion. We talked a little bit about the psychological portion, and now we get to end off with the social aspect of things. And and when it comes to the social aspect, just so that our listeners or viewers really understand, it kind of seems like it's the remainder of whatever's left, right? Whether it be cultural, race, socioeconomic, where you work, your environment you live in, your relationships around you, support you have, support you don't have, the care you're receiving or feeling like you're not receiving, you know, there's a lot to talk about in there, but to keep it simple, what shows up the most for you with your clients, as far as the social aspect goes? So the two big things that I would say are the cultural um, implications. So how does your culture perceive pain? Mm -hmm. And when I say culture, I don't mean like where you're from or whatever, but really it's like when you were growing up and you fell and you got a boo-boo, how was that dealt with? Was your mom like all over you? Like, oh my gosh, are you okay? Or was your mom like, eh, you'll be all right. Rub some dirt on it. You'll be fine. Right. <laughs> so like, that's a part of your culture, your individual culture as well. Right. Another piece is the economic issue. So mm-hmm. where you are socioeconomically, unfortunately, chronic pain really does impact people on the lower socioeconomic scale way more mm-hmm. because we kind of talked about this a little bit already. Nutrition is such a huge thing. Mm-hmm. And if you are eating processed food, high sugar food, food that really isn't real food, mm-hmm. let's be honest. Mm-hmm. You're that's going to be impacted and it's going to get 
it's going to essentially in, impact the rest of your brain body connection as well. So I would say the personal um, culture, as well as, you know, where you're from too, um, that part of the social, social piece, and then the economic piece is huge. For sure. And I, I believe too, as far as just location, you know, for our rural communities, you know, it can be really difficult to receive the care that they really need. And I think mm-hmm. that's, but that's the power of what we're doing here online. I think that's an important yes. factor, right? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the economics issue. We obviously know, like you mentioned, that lower income families struggle a little bit more. How do you help your clients through the care they need um, when perhaps they are in the lower socioeconomics? Like, I mean, we, obviously we talked about nutrition. There are, I think it's sometimes just the educational piece, understanding ways to be able to incorporate, you know, food at low cost and low effort. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah. Do you have any other tips that you might have just related to socioeconomic? Yeah. So you just have to be very creative Mm -hmm. and it has to be individualized. So like, for instance, if you aren't making a lot of money and you're living out in the middle of nowhere, you're not going to the grocery store to buy organic fruits, veggies, you know, it's hard for you to eat the rainbow. Right. But Mm -hmm. what, and it's hard for you, you know, you can't go every week. Right. Right. So having the fresh food foods is really difficult, but Frozen foods, actually flash frozen veggies and things like that are usually much, much, much cheaper. They last for way longer and actually nutritionally are about the same as fresh. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking out of the box and saying, okay, what can you do instead of going to the grocery store every week to get fresh vegetables and foods? Yeah. Um, And you know what? Even if it's non-organic, that's okay. It's better yeah. than eating um, hungry man meals right. <laughs> every day. On the box, right? Exactly. Yep. And it's just those little improvements. You don't have to go from like you know TV dinners every night to like gourmet farm to table, right? Crap in one big step. Right. It's really just little steps and doing what you can. Gradual. And I think you're right. Awareness is really where it starts from, right? Knowing that food has impact and that the gut mm-hmm. and the brain are so connected that once we know that, then yes. And if we start shopping on the outside aisles of the grocery store first, spend most of your time there, then it's a little easier. Cultural implications, like you said, sort of the environment you grew up in and the environment you are currently in, you know, those obviously have implications to our pain experience. Can you give me some examples of clients that you may have seen that struggled with this and what did they do? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So culturally, so, um, I have had the privilege to treat people from huge variety of cultures. So one interesting example is, um, people from the, like the Eastern European bloc. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really interesting when you treat people that are younger from there, they're like, no pain, no gain. Let me push through it. I can do all this, which is not necessarily always a good thing either, you know, middle ground. Right. right? But then on the other end of the spectrum from the same culture, I don't know when this switch happens, but the older women, especially suddenly pain is bad. All pain is bad. Mm -hmm. If I move and it's painful, that means movement is bad. Right. So there's a huge shift in culture and working with those older women, it's really important to do a lot of education to tell them movement is good. You need to move. It's going to be sore when you first start, Mm -hmm. but if you don't move, this is not getting better. Right. You know, and that's a huge cultural thing there because they want, they come in and when I was in the clinic, they just wanted the heat and the massage and they did not want to exercise. That was a bad thing to do. Right. So, and culturally that's what they've been told. Right. I agree. I, I, I see that in my, in my family as especially as they age, it's just that fear, like you touched on earlier, it's just gets straight bigger and stronger. And I also think too, that some of it is if they've lived with pain long enough, then of course, those behaviors become stronger and stronger and stronger, just like a muscle does. And they become yes. good at not moving. And so there's that cascade effect. There was a couple of things. I think one thing that a lot of my clients struggle with is knowing that the divide between when, so they're living with chronic pain, And then something shifts, something changes and that fear that they've done some damage that am I back to the acute stage all over again? And typically 
I try to explain to them that if, if something is remaining the same, if that pain is remaining the same, but you're just feeling an amplified version of that pain, it doesn't usually mean that you've done some damage, right? But how do you work with your clients when they're trying to decide? Because we also have on this, you know, this real struggle with our community where they know intuitively something is wrong. Um, and then of course, imaging is not showing that there's any damage. Right. And so they go from person to person looking for answers and they're just not getting them. And so of course they start feeling like it's all in my head. It's this loop, right? There's, it happens so often. So how do you talk to your clients about, you know, when they're not sure if it's an acute injury, if they've done some damage or if they're just really still in the chronic phase, but they need to work through more of the psychological piece. Sure. So one thing is, is there, was there an injury? Was there a mechanism? And that is super, super key. So let's say you've been kind of humming along, you've been having pain and then one day it just spikes. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, let's say you've had chronic ankle pain. Did you sprain your ankle? Did you roll your ankle the day before? If so, then there might be a little tissue damage. However, again, your body is built to heal. That is like the number one thing that your body does right. is heal. So even if there's tissue damage, it'll get better. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. But if you're humming along and you don't really, you can't really think of a reason why suddenly your pain is sky high mm -hmm. and you just wake up with it one day and you're like, well, maybe it was because I sat for an extra five minutes more than I'm used to, or maybe it's because I stood for an extra like 15 minutes more than I used to, yeah. then most likely at that point, it's just a significant increase in your body's sensitivity right. and or stress or fear response, that kind of thing. So if there's a mechanism of injury, yeah. then yes, you maybe want to go get checked out. If you roll your ankle, it's swollen, it's red, it's poofy, yeah. then you, you might want to get it checked out. Just get an x-ray, make sure you didn't break it. Um, but if it's, you're just waking up with pain randomly, then most likely it's just a, more of the psychosocial flare up piece. Right. Yeah. I, it's always such a great discussion around this topic because um, I do think that when it comes to chronic pain management, we still have a little ways to go yet to be able to really identify some of these things for our clients or for the physicians to be able to identify it give you an example. One of my clients has been living with chronic pain for years. She's known intuitively that the last three years has been different. None of the imaging is showing up any sort of diagnoses um, until recently uh, without imaging, but just based off symptoms, they have told her that she has a really rare form of a neurological um, issue. And so it checks off all the boxes for her, but there's that frustration around why didn't they pick this up earlier? <laughs> but there's also that feeling you're going right back into the fear. Okay. So is it acute? Is it something I need to fix? Is it truly a chronic thing? So I think there's that gray zone, which is really always challenging. And so I agree with you. I think we need to assess or always assessing, right? Always sort of checking in. Okay. How am I feeling? <laughs> Did I do any damage or am I intuitively feeling like something is bigger, but there's a fine line there too, isn't there? It's hard because we don't want them constantly, you know, seeking, uh, I have to be careful about that word, seeking a new doctor to be able to find the answers. But when they know something's not right, you know, we want to encourage them to also look for answers. I know that kind of sounds confusing for our listeners, but does that make sense? Like, do you, I know, do you come across that as well? Yeah. And, you know, as a provider, uh, especially in the medical community, it's really difficult. Like you have once in a while, you just have a patient where like, Hey, I actually have a cancer diagnosis. I finally got diagnosed. Right. Or so I get where the fear is coming from because yeah. everybody thinks that they are that person. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But that is the exception to the rule. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's one of those things where I encourage, like, if you need to, for your own mental health yep. to seek out those doctors, what, what have you go ahead and go along that road. Yep. Yep. And honestly, for some of those people, you know, they're, they might not be at the phase yet where mm -hmm. they're ready to sit down and settle in and change, right. which is perfectly fine. Everybody goes through this process when you've had chronic pain, right? Yeah. And for your own mental health and well-being, 
do it. Right. Go through it. Yeah. See the specialists, see the docs. Exactly. Um, and you're going to know at what point you're going to be like, you know, I get it. I've had enough. Yeah. I, I just want to live my life. Right. At that point, that's when we can really Right. No. So well said. Yeah. It's always a decision-making process, isn't it? But I think that's the important part is that it is a decision-making process. And when you are well-informed and well-guided, you can make those decisions based on what you know um, and how you feel. So thank you. That wraps it up really nicely. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to this conversation before we sign off? Um, I think so. This is like the one thing that I've been saying as often as I can is that if you have chronic pain, Mm -hmm. just know that this does not have to be your life forever. Like you can get better. And most people in chronic pain never, ever, ever hear that. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, I, they go to chronic pain management, which is a misnomer in that it is managing your pain. You're just, you're going to have to live with it forever, but you're just managing it. Right. But like you were saying before with the neuroplasticity and the, mm. how your body can change. Yeah. It's not an overnight thing, no. but you can get better. And right. I think the more people hear that, they start believing it and they're like, oh, maybe this is something that I can oh, do. I think absolutely. that's really important. Yeah. Hope. I love ending off on hope. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's true. I think the more people understand, um, not just I, I think too, sorry, as coaches, you know, we really help people work through the little steps to, to, to kind of progress forward is that it's that feeling of um, capabilities. You know, when you feel like you are taking action, you are helping to move yourself forward into recovery. You know, that word can be a bit of a loaded word. There are people who believe it's not possible because they've not been told it, just like you said, but recovery means something different for every person. You have to live rather than living under its crushing weight. Why not live alongside it? Get to know it a bit better. Yeah. Pan, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I do want to ask where people can get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you. Sure. Um, so I am, my company is called Pain Relief Path. Um, my name is Pan, like Peter Pan. You heard that right. <laughs> I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> And if you want to reach out to me, email is easiest, pan at painreliefpath.com. Um, I'm on Instagram under Pain Relief Path. I've got a YouTube channel. It's just Dr. Pan Zhang. And there's a lot of good information on there if you want to hit that up. Um, and I think those are the three big channels that I'm on. Awesome. I also wanted to say to our listeners that if you feel like you are at the point, I mean, just by you being here and listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube, you are likely either investigating moving forward or are already moving forward. And I think um, to get to that stage is pretty darn courageous. If you feel like you are not sure where you are in that stage of moving and perhaps diving into change, I do have a quiz um, on my website that I'm going to encourage you to go to pain number two possibilities.com forward slash quiz. And you'll also get some resources out of that one as well. Well, thank you so much, Pan, for your time today. We honestly could probably spend another two hours talking about this stuff. Maybe I'll have you on for another podcast, but thank you again for sharing your wisdom. I really, really appreciate it. Of course, it was a pleasure.